Jess, thank you. And um, good morning, everyone. Delighted to be here at COGEX. Um, as uh, Jess said, I'm Kate Rock. Um, I'm a member of the House of Lords Select Committee on Science and Technology. Um, I'm also a board member of the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. Uh, the centre was set up by the government in 2018 with a unique remit, which is to help the UK navigate the ethical challenges presented by data-driven technology and AI. Our mission is to ensure that the UK maximises the benefits of data-driven technologies and that those benefits are fairly distributed across society and to create the conditions for ethical innovation to thrive. I'm absolutely delighted to um, be joined this morning by Professor Sir Nigel Shadwell, who is one of the UK's foremost computer scientists. He's a leading researcher in artificial intelligence, and he was one of the originators of the interdisciplinary field of web science. He is principal of Jesus College, Oxford, a professor of computer sciencing at the University of Oxford. He is chairman, as Jess said, of the Open Data Institute, which he co-founded with Sir Tim Berners-Lee. In 2009, he was appointed information advisor by the Prime Minister and working with Sir Tim, led the development of the highly acclaimed data.gov.uk website, which now provides a portal to tens of thousands of data sets. In 2010, he joined the UK government's Public Se Sector Transparency Board, overseeing open data releases across the public sector. At Oxford, he has centred his research in human-centred AI in a wide range of applications, and most recently, he was asked to lead the setting up of the o Oxford Institute of Ethics in I AI. He has over 500 publications. He's researched and published on topics ranging from cognitive psychology to comput computational neuroscience, artificial intelligence to the semantic web. In 2018, he published The Digital Ape, a wonderful book about how to live in peace with smart machines. He is a fellow of the Royal Society the Royal Academy of Engineering and the British Computer Society. Nigel, it is absolutely wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Great to be here, Kate. Thank you. Um, Nigel, clearly the pandemic has, had, has helped a wider audience understand the important role that data has to play in our day-to-day -day lives. And today we're just going to talk a little bit about the risks and rewards of opening public data up to corporate bodies, and also, interestingly, the need for robust modelling um, around this current crisis. I know that you've been working with uh, the NHS's innovation unit on what core data is needed. And I just would um, ask you, what have you actually found? Yeah, well, the ODI has been um, uh, uh, working with um, the innovation unit and talking with them, trying to understand the, the requirements and what the what the what the situation on the ground is. And of course, what we understand is that any situation, any pandemic like this is an extraordinary uh, moment uh, to also help to convene the best science, the best health, medical research, the best efforts across all of society. And of course, that's certainly the case with data. Uh, at the Open Data Institute, you know, for the last almost decade, we've been pushing the idea that we need to release as much data as possible into the uh, public domain, seeing data as an infrastructure, um, as part as important to the fabric of the country as our ray, uh, as our roads and railways and and our on, on our electrical grids, data as infrastructure. Now, some of that data will be provided by government, some of it can be provided by the corporate sector, and a foundation layer should be openly available for all to use and innovate around. And what that means, it's not data that relates to our personal information, but it's data about you know, the, the, the spatial layout of the country, the weather, um, the, the state of our hospitals, the investments in our education system, um, where the trains are at any particular time, um, what the state of our uh, investments are from government into research of particular types, a whole slew of different data types. And you mentioned uh, our work in releasing that data, making it more widely available. And at a moment like this, it's surprising just how broad and wide ranging that need, data needs to be to help us respond effectively. So, Nigel, you, you, you mentioned there you talked a little bit about um, about corporate bodies, but you know, some naturally some corporates are, are, are cautious and usually for commercial reasons. And um, what can we do when companies are worried about the commercial implications? 
Um, I suppose the challenge is, is open da data always the best way? Can we encourage data to be sh sometimes shared in closed environments to, to, protect, to protect commercial interests? Yes, I, I, look, I think that um, we would always have a preference uh, if it was possible to make it more widely available and shared, uh, simply because we so very often see that the value to the wider um, innovation ecosystem means that everybody benefits. But there will be occasions when organizations, both private and public, will want to put some uh, legitimate limits around what is shared and how it is shared. And so there you need more if you like, uh, nuanced data sharing policies. But again, we've seen that in this context, there's some great opportunities to show just what that sharing can release, what's possible. And I think then the question is, well, you know, yes, we can agree to share for the purposes of the pandemic, but you know, will those uh, uh, agreements survive? Um, can we see uh, more uh, opportunities uh, to uh, continue these sorts of sharing. And good examples are classically the data that are collected by the big platforms or indeed the telco companies that have exquisite information around footfall. You know, how many people are moving through a particular place and space when they were. Now, that data, uh, suitably uh, generalized, anonymized, gives us a really good insight uh, when it comes to working out how to plan everything from lockdown to uh, taking people out of lockdown to modeling how we can manage certain sorts of public uh, places. So I think that's exactly you know, this this pandemic, this crisis has forced us to look at some of those sharing opportunities uh, and really work out how we can move things forward. Um, th thank you. You, you. you talked a little bit about the telcos. I'm interested. Have smaller companies played a role as well or are we just looking at more of the larger corporates? No, I think we have. And, and I think when we begin to see um, what we might be able to achieve here, uh, companies of all shapes and sizes become relevant. Um, and also, of course, let's not forget that the public organisations that we fund, you know, our various public services are also going to be a critical part of this. It's kind of the yin and yang of data. So we want also access to the data that our uh, public health authorities are collecting. We'd like it uh, immediately in real time if we could and just to take a concrete example you know we're going to be moving into an into a, a, a situation where availability and resourcing of just simple face masks will become increasingly important for a very large swathes of the population where are those things in stock where can they be got um, what's the current stocking uh, 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 ratio of a particular uh, corner pharmacy that kind of information is actually available in real time in a country like Taiwan. Um, it would be great if we were working towards similar sorts of real time instrumentation. And we've done it notably and very successfully in areas. If you're in London and before the lockdown taking your public transport, you'd be seeing in real time um, everything from your trains and underground services and buses, all the public transportation data is still, of course, being made available in real time. And, and that information, along with footfall, will be crucial to managing people's uh, flow through spaces in ways that are going to be, have to be more cautious and more um, um, uh, managed in a certain sense going forward. So, so uh, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Very interesting. I, I think, I think um, think um, one of the one challenges is also around quality of data. And have you learned anything about the quality of data and are you are you um, happy that you think it's generally been reliable? I think quality is always uh, crucial and always key. And again, at the Open Data um, Institute, one of the things we've been doing is working with um, a whole range of organisations to show how we publish data effectively. What is a, an effective use of, of open publishing? What does it actually mean? And the quality issues are key. Um, even if you don't have complete confidence in the data, that's not to say that you, you shouldn't publish it as long as the, if you like, the warnings about its accuracy or when it was recently collected or um, what the resolution of the data is. All of this, if it's uh, uh, associated with the data, becomes a really important resource. So um, you can never have perfect data, uh, but what you're looking for is data that is fit for a whole range of purposes and of course, in some uh, tasks, you are willing to have data that's a little bit out of date, that isn't the most current, or data that is um, quite uh, 
coarse grained in terms of what it's telling you. But nevertheless, lots of applications would still benefit from its publication, understanding the quality attributes of that information. So it, it seems that, you know, that commercial companies are opening up their data um, and, you know, government, private and public are working effectively together. But do you think that this this crisis actually might lead the way or, or progress more quickly that the, the data being opened up for, for future challenges in the, in the national crisis. Are you optimistic about, about the, the, the direction of travel? I really hope we can uh, keep the data flowing um, and keep this innovation cycle, this, this reflection around bringing data scientists and data providers and data generators, data consumers together to solve urgent problems. The problems aren't all of COVID. Going forward, they'll be hugely about how we manage to deliver our public services again, how we actually run large parts of our economy. And beginning to understand what good instrumentation does is hugely important. Some of the best examples are also, I have to say, within the public sector. Now, this is it may seem surprising, uh, but it is certainly the case that within the national health system, huge and uh, fantastic though it is, um, there are lots and lots of data islands. Uh, people have been working very hard, for example, just to bring together the patient records. Now, this is working within very controlled data hubs. Um, organizations like um, uh, Open Safely, uh, organizations like Health Data Research have been able to integrate for the first time large numbers of patient record data to see those trends in real time that are telling us who's susceptible, what effective treatments might be, what's the problem with certain sorts of comorbidities. And all that's being done within very safe environments where you as the researcher pose your questions and you get the results back, but you never get the underlying primary core data. So those models of integration and provision of data as an asset, we're finding them in the public and private sector all the time. And I think that's what we need to kind of try and build on those sorts of successes. That's, that's brilliant. Thank you. C can I just move on to modelling a bit? We um, every day we hear in the news, um, you know, SAGE, you know, um, uh, sort of organisations that historically we've never heard of before. Um, and a wide variety of models um, have fed into the UK's response to the pandemic, different modelling groups based at different institutions, and they've each produced several models. Um, and representatives from several of those groups obviously make up um, SAGE and SPIM, the, 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 the Scientific Pandemic Influenza Group on Modelling. Um, you have previously identified the need for multiple models under different assumptions and with different codes to sort of help provide more robust conclusions. And I just wonder if you could expand on why this is even more important now as we face this pandemic. Yeah, I think this is a really in, important point. Um, historically, I mean, if we write back to the beginnings of the scientific movement, one of the issues was being sure and confident about the methods of being able to reproduce findings to be confident that you've actually found a general set of rules or associations or causative mechanisms, whatever your particular issues were. And the great thing about science is it progresses by always standing on the edge of error, that the data may prove your model wrong, or it may require it to be refined in various ways. Now, epidemiology is uh, as, uh, and all of the associated modeling around it Modeling is about best efforts to try and understand the complexities of the world. And when epidemiologists uh, produce their models, they're entirely aware that they are making certain simplifications. You can't refine every as you can't model every aspect of the world. Um, you try and model those aspects you think are most important. And again, um, different modelers will, will, will emphasize different features of their model. But there was very broad agreement uh, amongst a large uh, swathe of, of the epidemiological world that certain sorts of models uh, describing transmission uh, susceptibilities, des describing how uh, infection uh, could be uh, uh, onward transmitted, there was broad agreement on these. Um, how you model them uh, could differ. So, uh, and even within uh, the imperial group, there were models which actually went down to the individual uh, population member, you know, imagining uh, 
individuals in particular parts of the country and their susceptibilities, so-called agent-based models, very familiar actually in AI, um, and then ran these big simulations. And for other models that simply tried to express the laws of transmission as they're understood in terms of in terms of certain sorts of equation. Now, these models um, are always going to be uh, tested ultimately against the data as we understand it. And that's the crucial thing here is to remember that relying on the models is one thing. The models are making their best efforts. But at the end of the day, unless you have the ground truth, which is where is the disease? What are its transmission rates? You can never, in some sense, hold these models accountable. So for me, uh, a key part of the of all science is the empirical piece of saying what's happening in the world. Test, 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 see where this disease is. Is it varying locally by geography? And, and so I think this, this, this uh, contest for different kinds of models, different assumptions is hugely important in science. And if you're going to do that, you've got to publish not just your data, but the models and the code, because most of these models are nowadays run as computer simulations. And the, so the code that implements that model needs to be published as well. And how does one refine the modeling? So, for example, if you're um, initially um, refining, uh, doing a model on a, let's say, a three week period of lockdown, and then suddenly it's um, it's going into a, a three month period, how quickly can that um, be refined and challenged? Well, again, th this is the whole uh, issue of um, what additional uh, considerations are put into the model. So, so the idea of how long uh, something such as a, a social isolation policy um, should be implemented, what that does to the transmission rates, how that then propagates through the rest. If you take that back off, how it, uh, a disease might reemerge. Um, the, the, these, these assumptions are, are critical and you'll be running your models across a, a fairly wide range of those parameters. You know, the what ifs, what if we only had six weeks or 12 weeks or what if we close the schools earlier? Uh, what if we'd... And, and so all of the assumptions that are currently being contested and, and discussed at the moment, people said, did we make a right decision around this or that? Your simulations are always um, never going to simulate every aspect of, of the world in which you live, but you do want them to be closely coupled to the, uh, to, to, to the presumptions and assumptions people are making. It's also important that people are confident that when the models that are made driving policy are being um, are, are being talked about, that their implementation, that their results are as expected. So uh, we've seen a very interesting example of this, where the imperial model has been re uh, 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 re re engineered and actually uh, republished as open data, which people can now. Um, go and look at, and people have just literally in the last day or so been rerunning it and saying, well, while some aspects of the original code may may not have been uh, uh, as every software engineer would have wished, the fundamental model that was actually written down was implemented as expected by the originators. So this idea that there was something deeply flawed in the way the model was implemented we can lay that particular worry to rest. Now, that's not to say there aren't other concerns, but that issue of challenge, that issue of being able to have this transparent access to the models, the data, and the assumptions and codes on which they're run, really critical. And it's surprising in a way that science not um, is still uh, have it is still moving along into that direction. Lots of areas of science have have, have had this built into their their rules of publication. Not all. I think this will be one of those areas where that will become a prime directive for most research. Yeah. Well, I think um, that sort of draws us um, really into the, the the whole sort of area around, um, uh, I suppose, about uh, public good and public trust. Um, the Centre for Data Ethics has recently completed a report on data sharing in the public sector. Um, it hasn't yet been published. It's due to come out next week. Um, but one of the key challenges it identifies is using data in a way that is trusted and trustworthy. Um, if trust is lost, we risk losing the opportunities to use data for the public benefit. And I just it would be interesting for you to expand a little bit on, on the value of public trust. 
Well, public trust is critical. And, and um, as we well know, it's the old adage, you know, trust is hard to win and easy to lose. So you have to be constantly uh, um, asking yourself, are you doing everything you can? And back to this, our, our previous conversation around uh, trust in, in scientific advice. This is crucial. I mean, the, the science insofar as we understand appropriate ways to be uh, to, to, to actually manage the pandemic, you're seeing something really exceptional in the joint effort across the country and across the world to understand uh, the nature of the disease and ways in which we may tackle it. Uh, and that is just the best of us in a sense, um, the de efforts to develop a vaccine, whatever. And so then we move on to the question of, well, where, where can issues around that trust fail? We talked about models. So I think, you know, trust is much better maintained if we're transparent in the process of letting people access the presumptions and assumptions. The data itself, uh, you have to have a sense of confidence in the uh, fundamental data that's being generated. And of course, there's been a, a, a significant discussion around everything around mortality, um, fatality rates. People would want to know that we are doing our level best to actually assess this data correctly. Once the data has been gathered, I mean, or if data is being gathered, it has particular value. People need to trust that it's being curated and managed and used in a way that is for a broader public purpose. And I think that's, again, an area that's important. We've, again, at the Open Data Institute, been talking about this whole idea of institutions, a uh, concept of a data trust, which is data, not all of which can be published openly, but that you might wish to share for a public purpose or that a set of um, individuals can make a, an agreement to share the data in a particular way and they trust one another to use the data in a proportionate fashion. We have seen uh, lots of examples and many of them in health in the past where the suggestion that the data is being used inappropriately or being exfiltrated and used in a way that the originating, uh, perhaps the patients or the country itself didn't feel it licensed or gave consent for, led to real problems. So trust is at the heart of our data architectures. Thank you. Nigel, lessons learned from, from, from the current crisis in terms of, of data and modeling. What are the things that, um, uh, that we know that that um, that we can do better as we go forward. Well, I think that we've we've touched on some of them. I think one is that um, we just do have to be able. It's all very well building um, and opening up some of our data assets, but we have to build an environment in which we can sense changes and effects in the environments we work in more or less real term, real time. Wherever we've done this, um, we've seen really extraordinary results uh, where you can do the predictive analytics, where you can use the power of AI to understand and, and, and help uh, improve and manage systems. So I think we, as well as understanding what data we make available, we have to say what data should we simply be routinely collecting and how do we make that process um, frictionless? And it's, again, not about making all of our private information publicly available. It's about picking out those patterns of activity that are relevant and making sure we have them in real time to our fingertips. So a, a data infrastructure and a, an ability to sense the world in which we all live is, is critical. I think another thing is this whole issue of... Uh, of, of trust that we've touched on. I think that's become very clear that we need uh, confidence in that. And part of that will be an understanding of how we curate and publish data. So again, I, I refer to the work the Open Data uh, Institute has been doing on this, on publishing data, um, giving help to people who think they might have an asset that they would like to put out there, giving them advice about how to do that, critical. And Nigel, um, you, you know, we, we haven't really touched on the international side of that. This is a global pandemic and um, every country is responding in a slightly different way. And I just wondered um, your your views on, on the UK um, as, a, you know, a, a, we are at the forefront of, 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 of data driven technologies and 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 ethics and AI. And I just wondered your views on the UK on the global stage in relation to this area. Yeah, no, I think the. Um... The UK, of course, people will uh, look and say, you know, 
was this was this in some sense handled appropriately or are we competitive in this area or that area? One thing the UK has a extraordinary track record on is the ability to gather and publish authoritative data. Um, we should really build on that. Um, the uh, And it's not just one agency. You referred, as, uh, for example, to new uh, institutions we have, like the ODI, like the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. But we have long-standing institutions, the Office for National Statistics, that have absolutely proved to be essential to the process of authoritative and well characterized data collected at scale. We should be putting those assets to work. And with that kind of capability and our AI um, um, capabilities, both in our research labs and corporately, I think we have a really important role to play within the international uh, arena as well. And our science is some of the very best in the world. And it will be the underpinning research that makes us understand both how to model this pandemic, but also how to treat it ultimately. Nigel, thank you. Um, I mean, that's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, we've covered a huge amount of ground in, in actually a relatively short time. Um, I think, you know, the importance of modeling, uh, the power of data and how to use it um, effectively for, 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 for public good in a crisis um, that is um, on, the, on the global stage. So. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here and um, I think we are moving to another stage to do a question and answer with the audience. Uh, so thank you, Nigel, um, and I hope uh, others will be joining us on the stage uh, a little bit later for Q&A. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogex.co.